Hey, Foilers. Ben and I need your help as we continue to work to grow it for God and increase the amount of listeners to the podcast. Here's what you can do to help. Head on over to our website, thetfhc.com, and be sure to sign up for the email newsletter. Doing so will make sure you get content as soon as it's available. Also, join us over at the Tinfoil Hat Club podcast page on Facebook, and be sure to follow, like, subscribe, and most importantly, share with everyone you think would enjoy the show on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for being fantastic and for all the love and support. Now, back to the show. And welcome to the Tin Foil Hat Club. I am Kyle. And I'm Ben. And we are joined once again by the lovely, the talented Maria. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Adrian decided to sit this one out, so we're just going to be the three of us. So thank you for returning as our guest. You get to fly solo. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to share a mic this time, though. So that's yes. that's good, right? That's, that's nice. So uh, last week, we just discussed where do you go when you sleep? Uh, this week, we're going to say one further than that, and we're going to say, where do you go when you die? I find this one to be very fascinating from a lot of different aspects, and I'm sure we're going to get into a lot of different stuff today about examples of, you know, there's tons of examples out there of people seeing things after they've passed away, and they hover over their body, they have out-of-body experiences, and then they come back. But one more than that, too, I think is uh, for us as Christians, what we want to talk about is I think that there was a, there's a lot of misconception. I know there was for me um, being brought up in the church about how this actually works and how the what the realms really are after you die. And as I've studied more and more over the last, you know, however many months, years, um, I have found that what I was taught growing up was a very simplistic uh, incomplete view of how the afterlife actually works. And we've, we've got several different scriptures today. And I know we've, we've kind of all maybe picked out some stuff that we wanted to to focus on, but, and we're not going to go through necessarily all the scripture, but I think it's really important to look up a lot of these, but when you go through your Bible and I would highly recommend for any of you guys listening out there, go just download the Bible app on your phone. It's fantastic because you can pull up multiple different uh, versions of stuff, but then you can also do searches. It's really handy. We just used the search feature a second ago before we got on uh, recording here and looked up a verse, and it, we found it really quick uh, versus having to thumb through your Bible. But, um, you know, you go in there and you search for realm of the dead, and you will come up with, I don't know how many verses, probably two dozen at least. And then that, that term is used very heavily in the Old Testament. But I think for starters today, I want to kind of start with Maria, and I'm going to ask you, because you come from a different background necessarily than Ben and I. I mean, all of us come from a Christian background, but you were more raised Catholic. So it's an interesting thing, because I think in this regard, the Catholic Church does a better job in some ways of explaining how the afterlife works than maybe the traditional Protestant Christian churches do. So what were you taught coming up about the afterlife? Um, I was taught about purgatory, um, and I was taught um, about limbo, where babies that were unbaptized that passed away would go. Uh, not so much that that was fact as where we go, but I was taught the basic ideas of those things. Um, but really, I would say for the most part, I would say I was taught more just the heaven, basic heaven and hell and okay. not, not more in depth. Now, do you, you're obviously been different because I, we obviously know your father and you were probably taught very differently than a lot of the other folks like me were taught and maybe not having a, a father that one is a pastor, but two is willing to go more rooted in scripture and less rooted in what someone in a seminary says. What were you taught? 
um, I was taught absent from the body, present with the Lord. But then um, we got into the sleep state, if that makes sense. Like you sleep, you know, oh, you're just resting. Um, we discussed a lot of different things. I mean, I shouldn't say we. I listened when people would come over and they would have these conversations. Um, I was kind of younger when a lot more people would be coming over, but I remember there'd be discussions of like, Hey, where do you, you know, we go, well, some say, you know, here or there or wherever, you know, but it was, it was never like, um, just not a ton of serious consideration. Yes. Yes. More just like fun, quick discussion. Yes. And, and, um, that's what I got, but I think, with that base, you can actually go and dig deeper, find things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and I've, um, I've went back and forth with it. Yeah. I think that there's, there are a few questions from the human existence perspective. Let's get very Zen. <laughs> right. Where, what is our purpose? Are we alone? And where do we go when we die? If I think those are probably the big three is there a God I think would be in there as well. Um, so those are the big questions that I think most people want to know the answers to. Yeah. What, um, when you were saying that what comes to my mind is David, perfect example. Um, when, uh, his baby dies, you know, when it was alive, he was mourning for, it and they couldn't understand why all of it. Why is he crying for the baby? But once it dies, he gets up and he goes, I'll join him. Yeah. And, but when Absalom dies, he mourned. So he uh, wasn't so convinced Absalom no. was going to be in the same place. No, he, he was. wasn't. <laughs> no. With good reason. Yeah. So um, I'll take a swing. Uh oh. Uh, for the limbo. I don't think babies go to limbo. Yeah. So I want to come back to that really quick because I, I, I will fully admit too. I'm, I'm asking a lot of the questions of you um, because I'm ignorant and I want to know more because it'll better prepare me to have a conversation with someone who is Catholic and maybe educate myself on what exactly do they mean by that? Where do we go? What do we mean by that? And where do we base that in scripture? Well, um, my understanding is, and I don't know that it's a current teaching yeah. that they teach any longer. My mom who had went to, she actually went to Catholic school and everything, learned some things that I didn't really learn in Sunday school and all that. And yeah. she had taught me when I was little and asking about babies being baptized and whatnot, that that, I guess, was a teaching at one time. They, they believed that I probably didn't want to say that they were going to hell, but they they do believe that you have to be baptized. So, um, so, and they, they haven't actually committed sin to go right. to hell should they pass before Or have the understanding the to make the choice of salvation. Yeah, exactly. Um, or as Catholics believe, um, you know, once you get up to confirmation, which is age 14, they're about, um, they haven't gotten to that point. Um, um, but yet they also, as infants aren't sinning. So then there's this limbo that they go to. And I do remember her, talking about that i don't know what scripture there might be for them to back that up but um and i i don't know that my mom believed that i yeah. so i don't i wasn't taught this necessarily as a fact and uh put a whole lot of uh thought into it i guess but um but just in my asking questions she just taught me that that is one of the teachings that they've had so yeah, because another thing that happens in those particular situations too, and it's not—I don't think it's necessarily just Catholic, because you have a lot of breakoffs from the Catholic Church. So yeah, I don't know true. how deep Methodist gets into that, or or Lutheran gets into right. it. Yeah, um, they may do similar things that I'm not aware of. But one of the other things too is I think—correct me if I'm wrong here—but if a if a if someone passes away that we do believe accepted the gift of salvation, but they were not baptized, they will do some kind of um, uh, sacrificial baptism. Mm-hmm. Meaning someone stands in your place and then you do a baptism that way. Is that correct? Uh, I have not. I was not taught about that growing up Catholic. So um, that I can't speak to. Yeah. I kind of remember hearing that at some point that they'll do that, but I could be 
I could be off in left field. Now, the purgatory aspect is another thing that I wanted to kind of drill into. What exactly do they, what do they believe in that? And where, kind of similar questions. What do they believe? Where is that backed in scripture? And where does that come from? Um, You know, I, honestly, I'm not entirely convinced it wasn't um, something they came up with when getting people to pay <laughs> money <laughs> mm. uh, to buy people out. Uh, Scandal. Yeah. <laughs> if because, only it wasn't real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am not sure of, uh, and any Catholics that are listening don't hate me, but <laughs> I've not found any scriptural Vatican basis City for is that. a very big place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of bills. I have not found any scriptural basis. Uh, and, and I don't, the church that I went to again, I don't believe that that was still a teaching that they had. I, I think that it's, um, maybe not something that they still, still really teach. And I have always kind of thought I had to go back to just getting people to pay money for those loved ones who had Ouch. passed on. And is that how it works? Really? Yes. Yeah. Really? So explain. I, I, I'm this. I don't know a lot about it. So explain. Please. Yeah. So if they had loved ones who had passed and uh, they would go to purgatory, and you know you could buy buy their way out, um, give enough, do enough things in church to to get them out. Thirty pieces of silver yeah. and get them out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I should probably mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> But since I have the mouse, I'm not going to do that. Well, that um, <laughs> probably like the closest thing today, like in modern that would even discuss it was on a Knight's Tale. They they were doing it on a Knight's Tale. The movie? Yeah. I don't remember this. There's like this little scene where um, they, they it's just like a side scene as they're walking through and they're talking about buying somebody out of pur- purgatory. Really? Yeah. Funky. Funky Cole Medina, yo. I don't remember that. I don't. I remember. love it's that been, movie, and I never noticed time. it either. It's so yeah. it's so cornball too. Like it just is a complete this is a complete deviation topic. But <laughs> you're watching this medieval, you know, themed movie, and it's got like all modern rock and stuff. Yeah. And it's just kind of weird. It just doesn't really go together. But oh, just, I love that. It's movie. still fun to watch, yeah, right? It is, it's still yeah. fun to watch. But I do kind of vaguely remember. But it's been a long time since I've seen that movie. Yeah. So, so you could buy someone out. Now, I I just want to pause here. And if you're Catholic and you're listening to the show, we're not trying to pick on you because I will state up right now. There have been many a swindler in the world that has, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it stretches well beyond Catholicism. Yes, yeah. Take your pick. There are swindlers <laughs> in every branch of, of religion you could ever dream of or any place you could ever think of. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty low down. Yeah. And if they're, if pony someone... up the dough or your, flam- your loved yeah. one stays in purgatory, <laughs> yes. purgatory. Yeah. it's like the mob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Pony up the ransom money or Guido. <laughs> Guido does your boy. <laughs> That's crazy. So, okay. Now, are you are you hip to this at all? Like as far as like knowledge wise or Oh yeah. All right, go for it then. Yeah, educate. Oh, oh, I thought you meant what she was in. Yeah, I'm like right like right that. Oh that's that's <laughs> what I always what you believe too. Yeah, that's what I was taught. So Well you weren't taught limbo and purgatory, but you No, just, but that's what my dad always said that okay they, that they were yeah to be okay. bought out pretty much it's a it was a money scandal yeah they had to build those cathedrals somehow they got a lot of dough yeah and yeah. i, I want to go to that again city it's it looks beautiful um but as far as that i mean like you said there's always a bad guy somewhere oh yeah somehow now is limbo and purgatory are those two different places uh, I always understood it to be. Okay. Yes. Yeah. The, the, there's really nowhere that, I, and if you guys are view differently than me, then I'm all ears, but there's really nowhere in the Bible that I have read, um, of multiple realms of like when I'm talking multiple, I'm like talking like more than two yeah. realms of the, of Sheol, the afterworld, the realm of the dead. Because when you say the realm of the dead, that has a singular connotation to it, but it's really not a singular place. And you can and you can see this very clearly in um, one of Christ's parables. And I will take the time to read this because I think it's very um, apropos for our conversation today and ties in very well. Because it really, for me, um, breaks down and gives you a good description of a lot of what's really going on and how the afterlife 
is structured. And it's in Luke 16, it's verses 19 through 31. So it's a little bit of a chunkier read, but hey, we got an hour and a half, so bear with us. That's right. Pull out your Bibles, hit pause, whatever, go for it. So here's the verses. Uh, There was a rich man who was dressed, now this is Christ, again, talking to a crowd. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now, some people will say that that is very specific why Christ is saying that, because I do believe the um, Pharisees at the time would wear purple robes. So he's kind of poking at the at the Pharisees at this point. At least that's what I've heard. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. At the time, uh, excuse me, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Uh, the rich man also died and was buried in Hades, not hell, Hades. We'll come back to that here in a bit, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good, your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, Between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And again, that's Luke 16, 19 through 31. So there's a lot of different things in here that you can kind of pick out and unpack. But one of the very clear things you have here is you have two very distinct places you have Abraham getting mentioned, which the one side is 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 paradise, which is Abraham's bosom, um, where you know good things are going on, no torment, people are okay, they're happy, it's all good over here. And then on the other side of the coin, you have this place of torment, clearly where this where the rich man has been sent, and Lazarus the beggar was sent to the good side, the rich man was sent to the bad side, right? And he's clearly in torment. Now there are a few other things to pick out in here which it says that there is a chasm that separates the two. Now, going back to episode one that we did when we talked about the book of Enoch, you can read clearly, well, not so clearly, it's actually kind of, it's kind of a hard read actually the way it's written, but you can pick out of there, there are different realms and and Enoch is actually being taken around and shown the different realms and he specifically speaks about this huge chasm that has been set between these two planes of existence. So it's kind of interesting because that lines up perfectly with this parable. So um, you can see that is going on here, and then he says that no one can cross between the two. It can't happen. And then we go on and we're asking you know, him to send Lazarus over to help save our family, and that's a no-go too. But what you're seeing here is Christ is telling everyone this, and obviously this is how things would work prior to his sacrifice on the cross, because everyone is is judged under the law. Yeah. Right? So it's just interesting because for us now, this is not what happens anymore. It's very different, and we'll get into that more. But see, now, I was never taught this. I was taught very simplistically that when you died— You either went to heaven or hell, which is a very simplified version of what really happens. I was never taught about these two places. I was never taught about the realm of the dead. I was never, none of that was ever discussed in church that I ever remember. I, I, I still to this day don't think I've ever heard a pastor ever talk about the realm of the dead ever. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I have either. Yeah. Now I don't know. I'm sure your dad probably has. No. No. Uh Oh. 
Now you said this before too, and he's like, "Yes, I did." <laughs> <laughs> so this will be good. You're you're going out there again on a limb. I like it. <laughs> I will say that mine says Sheol. Yeah, which is fine, right? I I don't have. Here's where this is. This is an interesting point too that we do need to pause on. What what version is yours, Maria? NIV. They both have their Bibles open in front of me, and I'm cheating and reading off the computer. So <laughs> I have an IV open. You have an IV, mm-hmm. and you probably got your your Jewish Bible, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Um, he's got an interesting Bible, and I would recommend this highly too. It's the CJB Complete Jewish Bible, and what it does is really good because if there is, and then correct me if I'm wrong, what, what you told me, if there is not a good um, English word. English word for the Hebrew word, then it leaves the Hebrew word in. Yes. And all of the books are yeah. actually in the Hebrew names. Yeah. So thankfully, when I looked at it electronically, there are little <laughs> cheater, like three letter you know, abbreviations for each book next to them. Otherwise, it'd be like, what? But it's not in the order everybody's used to. The Old Testament is not. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is it is it chronological? No, it goes um, the law, the prophets, and then the poetry they went they went torah yeah okay i see what they did it's like torah tanka ta, is it ta, tanaka tanka I, I, I don't know i don't whatever. know how to pronounce anyway, it they're not in order we'll just leave it there. yeah so if you get this bible and you think <laughs> oh remember that yeah it's a great it's i love to read it it's an easy read i've started to use that in when i do look up anything because yeah. there, there are a lot of things too. There are a lot of things that we talk about on the show that you aren't you aren't going to hear on, on Sunday. I just, that's why we titled the very first show what we did: the things that you don't talk about in church. And that's exactly what the the basis of the whole show is here, right? And this is one of those things where we don't talk about in church. And until recently, last few years, I had no idea. And then I started growing closer to God, and I started reading this. And then I read the Book of Enoch, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this now makes so much more sense to me. But this is my interpretation. I can back it up with scripture, but I'm I'm open to you know anybody else that has a different interpretation. So, the Book of Enoch is the Rosetta Stone. I do believe it is. Yeah, it sure makes a lot of sense. I think. Uh, uh, who said? Oh, I don't. Might have. I don't know. Somebody said that. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I don't know if it was L. A. Marzuli or. Um, blanked his name well i high five whoever said that because it sure has been for me my dad likes the guy he probably he could probably tell me his name real right off the bat your dad gave me a cd with a bunch of books on it so it's probably up there yeah probably is so now have you read the book of enoch maria no not in its entirety okay you kind of done like what i did i think i kind of dialed into the giant thing and then i kind of skimmed and skipped here the rest of a few other places yeah, I started it, started reading it through, and then I've kind of jumped around. Mostly, if Ben has pointed out various things. Yeah, so. I need to sit down and kind of do a deeper dive and read it, like again, like yeah. and actually dedicate to getting through all of it. Yeah, and the, but there's a ton well. of stuff in there, like just a lot of stuff. Now, the fascinating stuff, what drew me in was the stuff about the Nephilim and the giants and the pre-flood world, and and what you can glean from that. But this is a part of what's in there once you get through. The stuff about the Nephilim. This is kind of the next thing that you get into as Enoch is being taken around his tour, if you will, of how the spiritual world is designed and the different realms and stuff. And the first person he sees, or his spirit, Abel. Abel. Yeah, crying up. Yeah. Which, if uh, if you don't like reading, you can listen to Enoch in about three and a half hours. Hey, there you go. On Spotify. Yeah, it's a big book. It's a big book. That's a good idea. Huh, I'll check that one out. Good car. I guess I'm not in the car that much anymore, but <laughs> <laughs> working from here mainly, but that's a good good way to look at it. But yeah, it's interesting and it gets into this. So now the important thing to denote here is this is prior to Christ's death. And there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament that talks about this. So we're, for all of us now, it's a little different how things go. So just for clarity's sake, when you died prior to Christ, everybody was going to go to, quote, the realm of the dead. In Hebrew, that would be Sheol. In Greek, that would be Hades, not hell. We have a huge translational problem between Hebrew and English. It's like trying to translate four dimensions into one. It does not work well at all. And anytime you see hell, the traditional hell, at least for me, what I was taught, 
was really what we would call the lake of fire that's referenced in Revelation. Yeah. Is that similar to what you guys were taught? Yeah. When yeah. you say hell, that's kind of the image that's conjured? Yeah. Now, one of the things that I can see that you could pick out of what I just said was it it does say that he's he says he's in he's in torment in this agony in this fire. But this particular place is not the same place as the lake of fire that is used in Revelation for the end. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. So when you passed away, you went to either paradise, everybody goes to Sheol, and then Sheol is separated into two compartments, paradise or torment. Clearly, as you can see here in Jesus's parable. And he's not really, the only thing that he's doing in here is coloring some shade at the, at the Pharisees. And I think the interesting use of Lazarus was, I think that was actually maybe a little bit of humor. <laughs> Because his friend was Lazarus. Yeah. So I think he was just kind of flipping the tables on Lazarus a little bit. Because Lazarus, I think, was actually a little bit more well-to-do. I don't know. That's just me. I might be waxing romantic on that one. but (laughs) (laughs) Now, is this something that you guys are... Do you view it the same? Like, Maria, do you you view what you read the same way? Or do you view it differently? I I would say the same. Yeah. Yeah. And has that been something that's been more of a revelation for you since you've kind of grown in your faith over the last few years? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then how about you? You've said you've kind of done your own dive here. This is like my favorite story. The parable of the rich man. Oh, yeah. Because it just it just is like showing you what's going to happen pretty much. Yeah. It's an open book. Is and it's like you got two choices to make. Yeah, and I, I think you know John three sixteen is a good verse, but this story is a really good verse. Like it'll if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah, the the other scary thing is like, man, I I wouldn't want to be. Can you imagine being judged under the law? No, I know, like the Mosaic law, because y'all go back and you want to read. You want to slog through some stuff? Go back and read some of the Mosaic Law from the Old Testament. My, what they what we talked about in church the other day? They had six hundred and some laws that they had to follow. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, because well, we don't the, have to do that anymore. Well, the good thing we didn't have to keep all of it because some of it was for farmers, some of it yeah. was for women, some That's of true. it was for men. Yeah. So all total, there were that. yeah, all yeah. total there was six hundred thirteen because you know, but yeah. still. That's still is, brutal. Yeah. Yeah. But wait a sec. Well, we could parallel that to our laws today. How many do we have? How many do we have that are just broken and we don't even bat an eye anymore? Yeah. <laughs> Let me get really controversial right here, which is hilarious. I always find that this is controversial, and I'm like, it, the, the very definition of what it says isn't controversial because it's in the definition. I love how we get mad about wanting to kick out illegal immigrants or illegal aliens. I'm like... There, the name illegal is in the, <laughs> it's actually in the phrase of illegal alien, right? Illegal, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's <laughs> illegal. It's kind of in the front part of that. <laughs> I don't care. I'm like, if, I, I'm also on the side of the camp too of like, hey, if we want to have a path to citizenship, let's make it easy. I'm not making this a political show, but yeah. it just goes to show that, you know, it how we just cast away certain laws. Like we don't even bother to follow them. Like we don't have any wherewithal whatsoever to enforce the law. Yeah. We just kind of cast aside, which is kind of the reverse of what the Pharisees were doing at this time, which is why Christ is casting some shade at them here because they knew the law and they were teaching the law, but they were hypocrites because they wouldn't follow the law themselves, but they were expecting everyone else to follow the law and they were kind of using it to lord over, you know, the people of control. So it's a, it's an interesting dive too when you get into this and you get into the the book of Enoch, because the other natural question you have if you read that and you're like this is really fascinating, why is this not in our Bibles? And then you start diving into that story, and you kind of actually leads you right back to the Pharisees again, yeah. and when the Pharisees came to power and what they did when they came to power, and they kicked out all the priests, all the um line of Moses, the Aaron, Aaron, who was his brother, the Aaronic, Levitical priests. Yeah. All the Levitical priests, the Levite priests, the, the Zadokite, you know, you go back through the line, which is exactly who Christ came through and kicked them all out. And then 
they ran eastward to the Dead Sea, it seems. Yeah. Possibly to a place that rhymes with Qumran. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to make the rhyme. I do that so often. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> but in the Old Testament, prior to Christ, when you passed away, based on the law, you went. everyone went to Sheol, and you either went to paradise or you went to torment. I just want to make that clear. And there's some more evidence of this that we can see. Could this... I'm just throwing this out there. Well, I like it. Throw it out. Could this be a reminiscence of the first day where God separated light and dark? Maybe so. Sure seems the same. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because that's a different kind of light than the stars and the moon and the sun, Mm -hmm. which was created on, what, day three or day four? Yeah. So he's, he had to separate the darkness from the light. So who was dark and light in there? Yep. Good and evil. Yeah. Dark and light. Yeah, it's interesting to note. It would be interesting to note, too, and nowhere have I read in any of the books um, when the different realms of the dead were created. I would think that that probably happened after the fall in the garden, but there's nothing that says. Well, well, heavens and earth, I guess. Well, Enoch, when he was touring it, and there was only one soul in there. Well, because you're talking about you're talking about um, Abel. Abel again, yeah. right? I don't know. See, now I've thought about that too because you got to think from a timeline perspective. He calls out Abel, but I don't know that it ever necessarily specifically says he's the only one. Well, I'm just throwing that out there. I thought so too, and I'm like the the other interesting thing here is, and this kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into the works. When you read that particular part in Enoch, it almost to me almost reads like when you're murdered. Oh yeah, you get another place that you go. Well, we. You brought that up. I was thinking about that. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Maria, you were thinking about it too, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is all you guys fear. <laughs> yeah. The truth shall set you free. That's right. <laughs> for 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and is that still today? I don't know. I would, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I, I would think no. I would think no. And the reason I would say that is it seems like the one of the points of Christ was to simplify things. Yeah. And no, I mean if somebody is murdered. Again, I would I would still say no because for and this I don't know. I have no idea. I have no proof. I have no scripture to back this up. This is just me shooting from the hip. I would say no because the whole point of Christ was to make it simple to simplify everything. And now we are judged under Christ post crucifixion. All of us now that are, if you're listening to my voice, we are all judged under Christ. So you either accept the gift of salvation or you don't. So whether you're murdered, I don't think it really matters. Prior to your murder, did you accept the gift of salvation or did you not? Which is rough because of like, you know, you're 20 years old and you haven't lived that long. And you're like me, and you're stupid. <laughs> when I was 20, I was an idiot. You know, not bad idiot, but just not really living in accordance to, you know. Yeah. I, I don't even, I think I was saved at 20. I would have to really think about that. But, you know, and then you get murdered. Well, you had your chance. That seems kind of rough, right? Yeah. Whereas you're 70 years old, and then suddenly you've lived this life, and you get a chance to repent. Yeah. And then it's like, well, you had 70 years. I guess you're... 50 plus luckier than the 20 year old they got murdered. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I agree. It seems rough, but I think that if you're judged under Christ, you're judged under Christ. Yeah. You get however much time you get. And I don't know. What do you think, Ben? That's a tough one. And whatever, I just want to my, clarify my, why. My hardcoreness <laughs> <laughs> says yes. Yeah. But my. As I'm your soft serve ice cream soul. Yes. I, I, I am <laughs> the older I get and the more I look at things. This is, I don't want to say I'm becoming liberal, but I'm becoming like 
giving more thought to grace. Grace. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, I would, I would say you were probably done, but there's still, that's not, I'm not the judge. The only thing that I could argue against what I said on the flip side is there is nothing that I have ever read. Cause again, we're just all guessing here, right? This is just a, just a guess. We have no idea. Ultimately what matters is don't take the risk cause you could die in a car crash tomorrow we don't know if we're right. We don't know how this works. So find your salvation, get right with Christ and start living your life according to God and God, what God's will for you is there. I've, I've, you know, I put it out there. That's what you need to do. But there's nothing in scripture that talks about this, that I've seen with any level of complexity post Christ. Yeah. So we're just spitballing. <laughs> yeah. So, the other interesting thing here is, you know, and again, if, if this is all new to you, don't take our word for it. Please go get your Bibles and read. Go find that electronic app and go do some searching for Realm of the Dead. Uh, and you'll find all kinds of stuff. And it's fascinating. If this is an area that fascinates you, that pulls you in, what a great way to get in and start learning more about God. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you right now, listen to my words. I promise you faithfully 100%. If this is something that interests you and you start, whatever it is, if you start diving into your Bible with a sincere heart and you want to know more, God will reveal himself. I can promise you that. He yes. will. He will. So whatever interests you, dive in. But this is this is one that I think is one of the big questions for human existence. So pretty fascinating. There's some interesting thing in Psalms that I think we wanted to talk about. You had one that we found was the one we found just prior to kind of getting going and then I had another one that I had pulled up because um, this one, David is talking about it in Psalms, and then it's also echoed later by Peter, I do believe, or Paul. New Testament, I think it was Paul. And that's Psalm 16, and it's verse 9 through 10. And this is, again, David that's writing. And just for clarity, I think we talked about this in another show, but David... You know, we all think of killing Goliath and he was this king and he was the boy king and got hunted by Saul and all these famous stories of Bathsheba on the roof and all these things. But ultimately, he was a prophet. Yeah. And he was a, had a lot of prof prophetic stuff, especially in Psalms. Psalms is actually very prophetic. But in Psalms 16, 9 and 10, it says, Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will secure will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. So that's interesting because here you have David who clearly understands, like, I know that I'm going to be like everyone else that's lived during my time. And of course he has, you know, I think he knows that obviously Christ is coming at some point, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. So he knows that this is what happens. People die. They go to Sheol. Hades in Greek, and then they're going to stay there. But he knows that the Savior eventually is going to come and is going to not leave him in the realm of the dead. And I'm going to try to skim forward here in my notes and see if I can find it here. Where it talks about getting uh getting him out of there sorry i don't know maybe as we're talking i'll find it but it's echoed again when talking about christ it says even david knew that he wouldn't be left in the realm of the dead talking about david is david was dead yeah. he's in sheol and christ took him as well and that kind of leads us to part two of how things work so we've established how things work at least on the page with pre-Christ. Now, post-Christ, things are different. When you die now, again, we are all judged under Christ after the crucifixion. So if you have not accepted the gift of salvation, you have not had a personal relationship with, with Christ, okay, under that gift, then you are still going to go down to Sheol, but you're going to be put in the torment side. Yeah. 
And if you have accepted the gift of salvation, you now get to pass right over and you go to heaven as what we would traditionally know as heaven. Yeah. And you said before we started the, the verse about, you know, um, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yeah. Meaning when you die, if you've accepted that gift, then you're going to be with God or with, with Christ and God in heaven until he returns. Is that also the way, Maria, you see things too? Or do you see it differently? No, it's the same way. Same thing? Yeah. And again, you you as well? Yeah. Okay, so we're all on the same page. Now, how we got there is the interesting part. So you're like, okay, well, how do you know that? How can you distinguish these two things, right? How how did Christ accomplish that? And you kind of, t- it, it takes you back to that parable. And then you fast forward to his death because now we've established there's a torment side and there's a par- there's a paradise side in Sheol. And one of the last things that he says to the two th- you know to the thief on the cross, you've got he's hung between two thieves. He's got the thief on one side who is basically mocking him and saying, "Hey, you know, you're you're the king of the Jews, you're this dude that can do anything. Why don't you get down and save yourself and save us?" And then the other thief on the other side pipes up and says, "You know what, man? He doesn't deserve that." He doesn't deserve what's happening to him. We do. We deserve to be here. He does not. And he says, please don't forget me when you come into your kingdom. And Christ literally says to him, you know, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. Right. And which makes perfect sense because you fast forward probably a few hours and they're both dead. (laughs) And, you know, that, that arrives us at kind of a midpoint here where, Another thing that I was never taught is what did Christ do after he died? And I was always given the impression as a kid, well, he just laid in the tomb for three days and waited until he woke up. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> he was rather busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I've brought this brought this up before. Uh, the the book of it's a extra biblical text. Some people throw it out. Do whatever you want with it. It would be the gospel of Pilate and the two priests sons come back from the dead. When the, in Matthew where they're all walking around the dead are walking in the city. Now just for, just for clarity, let me pause just for everybody that doesn't understand what you're talking about. So after Christ's crucifixion, um, there is a, is it in, is it in Matthew? Yeah. In Matthew, they're talking about in Jerusalem, there were a bunch of um, Great, the saints group? or, uh, yeah, yeah. L- long story short, what, what it's saying, I forget the exact, exact wording and it could be different depending on translation. It's clearly talking about people who were holy people, yeah. meaning that they would not be the ones that would be reserved to the torment side yeah. of Sheol. Yeah. So the only ones that are walking around would be those that people knew to be good people. Yeah. So, and they were the priest's sons, the high, believe it or not. I know everybody, what, but they were oh, like the Pharisees. Yes. It was their sons and they caught them. <laughs> so this is the way I believe it. It has to I mean, it has to be true because it's, too crazy not to believe. But anyway, they drag them in and they have them write everything down that they've seen. And this is where it comes from. Now, these are the two, these are two that had just come back from the dead. So these are two like spirits that are walking around. Yes. Their body, whatever they are. Whatever they are. And so they, have you read this Maria? No, I have not. He's told me about it. You get all the cliff notes version. I do. (laughs) I want the cliff notes version of stuff. (laughs) And so, it starts like um, it's a conversation between a demon and like Sheol and another demon, and it's 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 crazy. And they're like, you need to make sure that nothing happens because something weird's going on. And so they're like, no, but nothing can bust through these gates. These are the gates of death, you know, mm. and that's why I brought up the Psalms, mm. the one. And so, which uh, I'll pause really quick and I'll read because it's a good place to put it in here. Um, you were talking about um, Psalms 24. Yeah. 
uh, and this uh, it's Psalms twenty four seven, and it says, "Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of Glory may come in." Yeah, yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. And so pretty much, Christ busts open the gates, frees all of all of everybody from like that died recently to Adam mm-hmm. and ushers them into heaven. Mm-hmm. But there, there was one last guy and nobody knew who he was and he was haggard. Just, he looked terrible and they were like, who's this guy? And, um, he says, I don't remember his name. He says his name and it was the thief. Oh, on the cross. Yes. He was the last one. Thank God. They were taken in order. Yeah. Now they, serving <laughs> 4,642. He was the last one and everybody was amazed. Last called at the DMV. Yes. And then they, <laughs> then he ushered to the men to heaven. That's kind of an awesome story. It is. I mean, it's, it's a good, it's a good read. It starts with the trial with Pilot. Yeah. And, and this is supposedly written by Pilot. Uh, it's like written like a few different, like a couple different people. Kind of, kind of comprised together. Yeah, because um, it, and uh, I think it's a, like a, the gospel pilot. It's it's a good listen if you really want to like listen to something, and it's it it gives you a better understanding of what was going on with the trial too, mm-hmm. because um, the Jews weren't allowed; they didn't go in to see Pilate, and even because they didn't want to be unclean. Mm. And they even brought that up because they were preparing for Passover Mm -hmm. and they got mad because, um, the standards, the flat, the Roman flags bowed down to Jesus when he came in, not the bearers, the actual flags. And they, the, they could see that and they got mad. The Pharisees did. And they were like, why'd you guys let them do that? And they're like, we can't control them. (laughs) And they said, well, we'll get our own guys to do it. But they'll, they're like, they'll be unclean, though. And they're like, we don't care. Do and, you know when this was written? Um, yeah, I, do. I have no idea. And they still bowed down. They had Jesus leave just to see. And they <laughs> brought him back in. And they bowed down again. And there, they said there was a pagan that n- recognized how powerful he was. And I think it said he took his coat off so Jesus could walk across it because he didn't think he should be walking on that ground. Oh, wow. So it just, I mean, it it adds credence that we don't have. And like I said, you believe it or not, but mm-hmm. if you read it and you look at it historically, it fits. It fits. And there's no, there's no crazy. I mean, they're spiritually, you might think, oh, no, but it all backs up with Old Testament. When the ark was setting in the temple of Dagon and Dagon fell, Christ coming into the temple of heathens and their flags falling, it all makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, I've never read that. I'll have to get my hands on it and see and read it. You can listen to it on Spotify. There you go. Spotify is the magic. There's a lot of good stuff on Spotify. I know. You should check us out too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> It's our first shameless plug right I there. I know. <laughs> it took us uh, it took us eight episodes, and finally there's a shameless plug. Good job. You played right into that. Very well done. See, look at this. This is working out great. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, so you have Christ that descends, and this is exactly what happened. He dies. He gets crucified. He gets put in the tomb, and then he descends to the realm of the dead. And this is exactly where we're talking about David, you know, saying that I know that I will not, the Lord will not leave me to the realm of the dead, and it says that Christ made a proclamation. Uh, well, Christ did a few things when he was down there, yeah. but and some of it ties directly back into Enoch, but specifically he um, set, you know, when we talk about set the captives free, that's exactly what we're talking about, is he went down to the paradise side of Sheol and set all of those people, quote unquote, free and took them to heaven. And that's why it correlates perfectly with what we can see in Jerusalem with these risen spirits or whatever they were, resurrected people, because they had been resurrected from Sheol yeah. and, and if I remember taken to heaven. Right, if I remember right, they were only around for a few days because then they went up too. 
Yeah, I do believe it says that. I don't know if I have it here, but um, I do believe it says that. Yeah. I think it was like three days. I just read it not too long ago. They were around for, I want to say five. Like just the... But it's something like that. It's three or five days, something yeah. like that. But yeah, it's it's really fascinating um, because it fits perfectly with, with what you read in Scripture. So that's why, you know, I I tend to be skeptical. Anything that I read, and I would encourage anyone to do the same thing, anything that you read that's extra biblical, no matter how how much it blows your socks off, take it and compare it to known scripture. And then if you can, I always say this, if you can punch holes in it with scripture, it's probably not good to read. And when you do that with like you, that's kind of what you were alluding to with the gospel of with a pilot is it doesn't necessarily, you know, contradict scripture in any way. No. It and it actually seems to fit backs things up. Yeah. It backs things up. And then, so like when I've looked at Jubilees and I've looked at Enoch, it's the same thing. More Enoch than Jubilees. I haven't dug into Jubilees to the degree that I've dug into Enoch, but I've dug into it quite a bit. And I, there are a few discrepancies here and there, but I need to dig into those a little further because I've also, in doing that, found that there are discrepancies within the account uh, of Genesis in a few places too. Um, there's one specifically where we've talked about it before where it's lineage discrepancy. Yeah. I found another one in there too. I don't remember off the top of my head what it was, but it did not align with another book in the Bible. But not the, to say that Genesis is not good because I think would, it they, is. They just didn't mention somebody because he was naughty. He was naughty. And that not, it's so funny, man. <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys, if, have you, did you tell me you guys have watched the Netflix special? I've plugged this so many times on the show. Netflix, if no. you're listening or anyone knows anyone at Netflix, you owe me money. <laughs> Because <laughs> whatever whatever audience we have, I have pumped this show into their head. The Graham Hancock thing of Ancient Apocalypse. No. It's so crazy. We, we watch more and more stuff here recently where it's like, oh, my goodness. And I know somebody listening to the show has watched this, and you guys probably have too, Ancient Aliens. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's so funny to me watching Ancient Aliens because it's like <laughs> they think everything was a flipping alien. <laughs> <laughs> aliens did everything. Uh, they were. Uh, I saw one the other day where they took the book of Enoch and they were making Enoch. Uh, yeah, I've, I've <laughs> Enoch, heard that. Had, Enoch had been taken by aliens to another realm and everything else. And I'm like, wow, wow. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, you've stretched this bad boy so far. It's like the Play-Doh's ripping. <laughs> oh, and all, speaking of, sorry. Also in that book that I was talking about, that they even say the two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah. Oh, in Pilate? Yeah. That was the other one you were talking about, which makes sense because oh, it was Elisha that was taken, right? Not Elijah. No, it was Elijah. It was Elijah. Elijah. Yeah. I always mess that up. He was the one taken in a chariot, didn't yes. die. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. They're the two that never died. But it yeah. never says what happened to Elijah afterwards, Just right? Said, well, it said the Lord took him for he was not. Yeah, but... Same language as... With Enoch, it kind of gets into more of what... I think this one you got to go into Jubilees to kind of yeah. compare notes because we talked about this in a previous episode too, where the way it reads to me is Enoch was actually taken and he is now the scribe of heaven yeah. and he writes down in the book of life, uh, the sins of, of all mankind, which, you know, I mean, God can do anything. He could have a magic pen that just sits there and records everything or not even a pen. It just shows up, but it's kind of a interesting, yeah, interesting dive. So Christ goes down, he sets all the, quote unquote, when we say the captives, we're talking about the people that are in paradise. Now, they're not in torment. This is not a bad place. And you can, again, read about more of it in detail in Enoch, but it's not a bad place. It's not a place where you're going to be any suffering, but you're not present with the Lord. Yeah. Right? That's the downside to it. So I think the way that I would equate it to, I don't think it's Eden, but it would be Edenic-like, but without the presence of God. Yeah. So you don't, I don't, you don't obviously no suffering or anything like that. Well, Christ does away with that. And now post Christ, when we pass away, we either go to Sheol and we wind up in the torment side or we go to heaven like we talked about. So then you get into hell. So that's the one thing we haven't really kind of touched upon in too great a detail yet is like, okay, then what is hell that we're tr traditionally taught of? Because the simplistic thing to say is when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell, which isn't necessarily wrong, like we talked about upstairs, but it's just incomplete and kind of 
I don't like incomplete. <laughs> I want to know how this is going to work. I want to know where the stops on the train are, yeah. yo. <laughs> yes, I want to know what to expect. When I'm in Chicago in the loop, I want to know what station's next. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, and you can see this here because we, we read when you don't understand this, right? You read certain things and they don't make any sense to you. And one of the things that I read prior to us getting going, well, first of all, to back up what we said, Revelation is really fascinating for some of this stuff because you can pick up a lot of things from Revelation. We tend to think of Revelation as the, as the end story, which it is, but there's a lot of other things in Revelation too, uh, such as the story of Satan and the fall, that's in Revelation. So if you want to know kind of the beginning before Genesis, just like all good books, you go to the end and you read the last part first. Christ's um, birth. Exactly. So, um, but in Revelation one eighteen, you can see I am the living one. I was dead. And, and this is Christ again talking. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now that makes a lot of sense based on what we just explained, right? Yeah. And... um. Yeah, there was another line in. Re- There's a lot of good stuff in Revelation, and I, maybe I didn't record that one either. Man, I I had so many good verses, but I'm thinking that I str- swung and missed on this one. Um, oh no, here it is. I got it. Uh, this is the one I was talking to Maria a little bit about before we started recording too. And this is Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place uh, for them. And I saw the dead great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. Thank you, Enoch. (laughs) The dead were judged. I threw thank you, Enoch, in there. That's not part of Scripture. Uh, Boy, would that be fun (laughs) if it was. (laughs) The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So you read that. There's a couple things in there. But one of the things that you read is second death. And you're like, what do you mean second death? That doesn't make any sense. For me, as an ignorant Christian, a few years ago, I would read that. And I'm like, well, that's really weird. Anyway, I'm going to keep reading. And I would just dismiss it and move on. But now what we're talking about, you can fit that in because the first death would be going down to Sheol to torment. And then this would be at the final judgment when Christ returns at the very end of the show. We're going to have everyone placed into the lake of fire. And that's Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. So you can read that in there and it says the second death, which makes sense because technically that would be a second death, right? There's another thing that we kind of have talked about a few times, I think, off off the uh, off the record, um, where there's a very strange comment that Paul makes, and it seems like he's referencing himself, really. Yeah. Talking about having like this out-of-body experience, and he is taken to what you would also read in Revelation at the end would be the New Jerusalem. So after everything is all said and done, and Christ returns, we're going to, all of the souls that will be in heaven at that particular point with Christ and with God will be taken and we will be placed in this new Jerusalem that is very descriptively, you know, outlined in Revelation. And Paul is kind of saying that he saw visions of this place because he refers to it as the third heaven. Yeah. Well, that's an also a strange statement when you don't understand how the afterlife works because it's like, what is he talking about third heaven? There's only one heaven. Because like traditionally, that's what I was taught. There's only yeah. one heaven. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, no, that, that would make sense because you'd have three because you would die and you would go to paradise. That would be one. Yeah. And then after Christ, crucifixion on the cross, those people were freed. And like us now, we go to heaven when we die until Christ's final return. And then the Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, which would effectively be a, it seems like a recreation in some ways of back to the uh, Garden of Eden. Yeah. Like a more opulent Garden of Eden, maybe even you could kind of make the argument. Thus you arrive at three, third heaven. Now it all makes sense. But until you know how all this works and you've really pulled this apart. You're getting too literal. I know. You need to throw some like. I'm never uh, going to be a politician. <laughs> 
<laughs> you need to throw some like uh, some platitudes in there because most people don't don't even think that way. Well, I'm a dweeb, so. <laughs> But at least I'm a Bible dweeb. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, that, that's so true. Nobody No. I had no idea. Yeah. I, I everything that I'm saying today comes from my own come my own revealing of my own ignorance. Yeah. Truly. It, that's exactly what it is. And I want to help someone else who doesn't who is on the same road that I was on. I'm pulling up the car. I'm safe you can get in. <laughs> And I want to take you where to a new destination that will like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense now that you read it. Because I think we read so many things in the Bible, but because we've had this incomplete picture, because things have been removed or... We keep it very spiritual. We do. We don't, we don't make it literal. Yeah. And obviously that's tough because there are sometimes things that are not necessarily literal, but yeah. there's a lot way way more literal than there is. And and I think figurative. Um death is a touchy subject anyway. Nobody knows how to address it. And which I never when some I have no idea what to say to someone because I'm like mm. but look, send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> but when you know where you're going, yes, it's oh, you know, very simple. It it really is, and again, I think that so that so we kind of arrive at another another question. Of this is there anything that I've missed here? I think it, I think we've kind of dan- we've danced around, but made it pretty clear of like where you're where how this works. Yeah, right. How this works, and this will continue to work the same way until Christ returns. Which, if you go and read your Bible, this kind of leads down another road of controversy, which you get into rapture. We're not going to get into rapture today because that's a whole another show. <laughs> We're not going to touch that one, but. Because then you get into, is there rapture? Is there not rapture? Breaking apart other verses. But anyway, we go through I'll a just whole, say, no, there's not. Bang, there it is. <laughs> not in the tradition. You know, one of the things that I find, we're not, again, we're not going to get deep into this. This is, of course, what we always say, right? <laughs> Sometimes, and then we open, yeah, I did that and then because we open you do that. Gates. So- <laughs> I know. Thank God it. But we, I think that that also stems a lot of times. Uh, some of the arguments that I get in there stem a lot of times from not understanding things. Yeah, they don't understand what they're reading necessarily. Yeah. Now I, I have not studied it enough to be able to. I always say this: my term is plant my flag. I can't plant my flag anywhere, but it sure seems to me I have not read anything that makes me think that we're going to be poof taken away. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, Jesus said bunch like the harvest when he's talking about the harvesters coming and he says you know bunch them together but take the weeds first yeah i don't so so f- for those of you i mean the bad people go first the wheat stays <laughs> <laughs> sorry everyone <laughs> Not my words. Those are Jesus. I, know, I just yeah. paraphrased. <laughs> well, one of the things that I find is a common common issue right out of the right out of the gate, or a common problem right out of the gate, rather, is people misunderstand what we would traditionally refer to the rapture. I.e., we've begun the tribulation and everybody gets poof, taken yeah. away. Right, that are believers. I see a lot of Christians who confuse that with the second coming. They intermingle. Yeah. They intermix those two terms together, and that's not accurate no the second coming of christ is the end of the game yeah game over we've gone through all of the trumpets and the bowls and we've done all of the things that are going to really stink god's wrath god's wrath and then christ returns yeah it's at the end of the story that would be the second coming of christ he does not come back until then yeah so again you see is that the same thing you guys both see yes you as well, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Again, sorry, sorry. Whole another show on the rapture. <laughs> that was a pretty good paraphrase, though, in three minutes and 30 seconds, because we started talking <laughs> right at an hour, so that's not too bad, actually. There you go. There's our there's our three minute and 30 seconds set up for a future show. If you don't want to get into something, don't take Ben past the gate, because no, he's no, no. going to run. No, I know. And <laughs> listen, right think of it like this. Ben and I are like <laughs> skipping hand in hand as we travel down <laughs> trodden roads that are far off of where we started. <laughs> Well, we always seem to circle around the tree and come back to the main path. Yes. It's part of the charm of the show, really. Yeah. yeah. Yes. All of the all of the uh, folks out there with adult ADD unite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's what we're here for. We're yeah. here to help you with your adult ADD. This is your this is your drug for adult ADD. That's right. It's okay. God likes your ADD. There's a lot, man, there's a lot of things. The, the 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 Bible has such complexity to it and so many circular references. And I'm still trying to do this. You have to not read it from a 21st century Western yeah, yes. English speaking perspective yeah, absolutely. because you're never going to get it. No, you're never going to get it. And there are so many circular references to Old Testament stuff that if, and this is an error, I've said it before, I'm not, I am not as strong as I should be in the Old Testament. So that's something that I'm going to really try to work on myself because especially now, I think one of the things that I had a problem with, with the Old Testament is it just, a lot of it didn't make any sense to me. But now that I have kind of the, the Enoch, the Rosetta Stone, that I can plug in knowledge wise. Now I can go back and I can reread the old Testament. And a lot of that stuff will make a lot more sense to me yeah. because you have the context as to why things are happening. Yeah. The other thing too is <clears throat> no matter how much you may hate it, you really need to know geography. I'm finding out how important understanding the, you need to understand the history side because that's important. But with that, you really need to understand the geography side because when you don't understand the geography side, you will read things and not understand what's happening. Yeah. And a perfect example of that is what Christ is doing at Caesarea Philippi. Yeah, I know. Because you have it get, never mentions Mount Hermon anywhere in no. there. So you have no understanding of where he is. Yeah. I don't even think it says land of Bashan. No, it just says Caesarea Philippi. And you have no under, and cause, because for them, when they were writing it, they're like, yeah, Caesarea Philippi, it's right there at the base of Mount Hermon. Everybody knows that's common knowledge. Yeah. It would be like us saying Washington, D.C. Well, yeah, everybody knows Washington, yeah. D.C. is the cesspool of all evil in our country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong out there. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, we continue on. But everybody knows where Washington, D.C. is. If I said the Washington Monument, everybody would know that's in Washington, D.C. Why would we? We don't need to say that. Yeah. Right? Common knowledge. But for us, it's not common knowledge anymore. No. Because we're 2,000 plus years removed from all this and way longer than any events that happened on Mount Hermon between angels. That's however many, seven, nine, ten thousand years ago, however long that was. A long time. Yeah. So we just don't understand. So you need to have the history and you need to have the geography for any of this to make start making sense. And once you get even a, just a little, just a little bit of it, then it starts to really snap into place. Yeah, it does. But Enoch is the big key to all of it. Yeah, it is. Because like when I when I read the section, as hard as it is to understand, when I read the section about the different compartments of Sheol or when he's being taken around. That's when I started to click in my brain. When I would go read other things again, I'm like, Oh my gosh. Now I understand the parable. Now I understand the parable of the the rich man, Lazarus. Yeah. Didn't he say it was like, it was huge. He said, and he asked who made this. He describes a lot of stuff and I'm still, that's a, those are verses that I need to just, I need to almost sit down and chart them out because they're very, they're very, it's just hard to read. It's It's like complex. Yeah. And he's like, what is this thing? And it's so great and big. And I mean, he goes into like detail that walls were smooth and yeah. And, and uh, I thought of, <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Every time we got I, horse laugh, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is going to be good. Every time I I think of that, I think of how the Hobbit starts. He lives in a hole. It's not a slimy <laughs> hole. It's not. That's what I think of. I think of <laughs> Tolkien. <laughs> so what you're saying is, Sheol is Hobbiton. Yes, <laughs> and there are a bunch of Hobbit holes. <laughs> I like your version way more than what I read, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, you have something pulled up over there, Maria. What do you got? I do. I was looking at Maccabees, um, just thinking through purgatory. And, oh, uh, is there yeah. stuff? Now, I, haven't, I have Maccabees upstairs, but I haven't read it yet. So, I was thinking, I bet it's in the Apocrypha. Ah, because, ding. yeah. And so, I just did a quick search just to kind of look through. And in... Uh, Maccab- the second book of Maccabees, twelve thirty nine through forty six, 
Um, there's Judas Maccabeus. I don't mm-hmm. know if I'm pronouncing that correct. Praise mm-hmm. for his fallen comrades who had died in battle while wearing amulets dedicated to pagan idols. And so he's praying for the dead. And I, I kind of when discussing purgatory. I did talk about the buying people out, but you can also pray for loved ones. And that is a lot of, there was a period of time, yes, where it was paying to buy them out of heaven, but, but also a lot of it is that, that they can pray for them still. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe this goes to, you know, we're talking about these different layers and you've got um, Hades. And so I wonder if perhaps Mm -hmm. it could go to where before they're in the lake of fire Mm -hmm. and they're in this Hades place, Mm -hmm. if um, between that scripture and, and then this other place kind of in between there, Mm -hmm. uh, if that's where they're getting this. And, um, and I also, it's interesting that the, the, his comrades had, Jewelry on dedicated to pagan yes, idols. Yeah. Well, that tells you some stuff about Maccabees right yeah. there. And, yeah. um, and I also found that in um, the book of Matthew, uh, verse 1232, Jesus Ooh. states that whoever speaks against the holy city will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. And that's believed to imply that there are at least some sins that can be forgiven after you've passed. Um, you said so, Matthew 1231? Uh, 32. Oh, 32. Mm-hmm. So I will read that actually. Um, here's the, here, this is the ESV version. Um, I'm going to read, let's see, for context, I will back up a hair. I will read when Christ begins uh, speaking about what he's talking about. And this is actually in verse 25. Well, actually, I'm going to go back a little bit more than that. Because um, it's verse 24, because the Pharisees are getting on someone for casting out. I think they're getting on him for casting out demons. And they say, which makes this dumb. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, that the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Uh, knowing their thoughts... He said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided uh, against itself will stand, which is a famous line that we even still use today. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? (laughs) Like, oh yeah, your boys are casting stuff out. How are they doing it? Therefore, they will be your judges. But... If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven uh, people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. So it's that last part, in this age or the age to come? Yeah, and so that apparently lends itself to possibility of forgiveness after this in life. In my Whoa. Bible. Boy, that's flimsy. Yeah. <laughs> in, in my Bible. Now, this it, is the Jewish Bible. The, there is no age to come. It's all in Hebrew, and I can't even pronounce those words. <laughs> oh, so they left the Hebrew word in. Yes. So someone decided that age to come was a good translation. Yeah. Well, not- <laughs> now, when I read that, I don't. that's one of those things where I don't read that to be literal. I read that to be like, he's just saying that, you know, if you want to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, no matter when, you're not going to be forgiven for that. No matter if it's here or until the end of eternity, it is never going to happen. Yeah. So, oh, whoa, that's a big word. Speaking against, oh, well, no, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> ben slid me his Bible, and I've got it now in front of me. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a Hebrew word. They obviously did not feel comfortable to translate, so they just left it right there. Yeah. Now, an interesting one that I have not thought about until just now that I would like to dive into, not on the show, but I'll probably do it separate, would be Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Yeah. I would like to dig into who Beelzebul is. Because I think 
again, common accepted thinking would be we're talking about Satan, the devil, Mm -hmm. right? But before, it's two different people. Mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't say two different spirits because... Now, what you mean by that is you mean it's not the devil and it's somebody else. Yes, because before then, Jesus says Satan casting out Satan, and he was very specific when he said Beelzebub. Mm Mm-hmm. It's 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 an interesting thing. This leads us down the road of Job too, but oh, we shan't <laughs> go there. Because <laughs> when you read Job, everybody thinks it's Satan. And we had a discussion about this last mm, week. And, we did, and uh, this was off the air. And do you remember? What? <laughs> not anymore. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were we were asking uh, off the, off the air. We were discussing what we thought. Um, Satan was like then, and I said it kind of was like a I envisioned like this mobster guy in Job. Oh yeah, I had some mobster. Uh, yeah, I, I went Brooklyn Bro- yeah. leg breaker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, because I had fun you, with that. When you when I read, I don't know when you, you guys read. You tend to put I tend to put different characters. With who's being at the time, like Guido, Guido, yeah, hit him yeah. With a bat. It's like I, you know, I have, but when you when I read or listen anything with the Bible, I don't put the same face with the devil or Satan or anybody because it's it's a it's almost a spirit of attitude, if that makes sense. Yes. I think the one thing that we're really the the road we're we've now just walked down is where I think this is an important road, and this is probably good to spend the last few minutes of the show walking down it because there are definitely two schools of thought here, and the more common school of thought is just believe what you've been told, don't question God. Don't question the things that you've been taught and don't question things in your Bible. Now, I know that sounds strange on the surface, but here's what I mean by that. I think what that what that causes is we don't we feel like in some ways we're challenging God in a negative way when we read something and we don't understand. And it's been I know it was definitely ingrained in me. Don't bother to look any further. You won't understand. You just are too basic. You're too much of a baby Christian and you don't understand. And it's just better to not even go down that road because it's too scary. It's too dangerous. It's going to break your faith. Mm -hmm. And I am here to tell you from a personal standpoint, I think that that is the worst philosophy on the planet. Yeah. Because I think that that absolutely stagnates your growth and keeps you from ever arriving at a point of mature Christianity that is necessary in order to effectively disciple another human being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like killing the root of the tree. I always quite, I still question why God chose Saul. You mean to hunt David? Yes. Like, uh, um, as King, I still, Oh, cho- oh well, yeah, I still, uh, and I, whenever I'm like, he knew what he was going to do. You know, I, 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 but this gets, see now this, this, this lends us down another road that branches off of the road I just talked about, yeah. because th- this is another area too, where, oh my gosh, do we have a conversation about God's omnipotence? <laughs> do you guys ever have a conversation about God's omnipotence? Um, like God, forgot, God, no. <laughs> God <laughs> yes, all knowing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. We talked about that. Like, it was like, I forget. It was the first episode. It was like, oh yeah, the dude on the boat. Poop. Yeah. I, forgot. I was having this like, I just picture God like on a beach, you know, having a Mai Tai. Yeah, the only know. people in existence yeah, at the so, time and, and God remembered God, them. God remembered Noah. <laughs> but again, there are very clear I- examples in the Bible like that. That's a good example. And of Moses how, arguing with God. Um, where, when God said, I will wipe these people out and make you, make you a great nation. No, 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 (laughs) no, don't, don't. Yeah. And then Moses going to God, I will just go ahead and kill him. God, no, no, no. Yeah. Because they were in a relationship. Yes. They, I don't want to 
they were like a husband and wife relationship, honestly. Yeah. yeah. They they were in charge of the kids. The, and there's always one parent that kind of gives a little grace. Now, sometime. which one of those is in? <laughs> no, I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> now you I'm know, just causing it, it just depend. It just depends on, on <laughs> like, so I don't, I wouldn't know if, the, you know, God knew. You know, it's it's a it's a it's almost like a mind twist, the same as how God can always be. Because as a human being, your brain just can't handle that. It'll turn your brain into soup. Mm -hmm. If you really sit there and think about it, it'll just turn your brain into stew. Because we just can't understand. Because we do not have the the complexity of brain to understand how something can always be. Because everything we experience, even the modern thinking of how the universe came to be, which is completely hilarious. Begins and it has an end up beginning and an ending, a birth and a death, right? Yeah, we can't do it. But there are so many things in the Bible that talk about how I think I'd have to go pull some of the verses, but there are a few verses, even in Genesis. When I read Genesis, I do not read it rhetorically, I read it like, Why are you hiding? <laughs> yeah, like I don't, I don't read it like, Why are you hiding? Yeah. You know, I read it like God is genuinely like, why are you hiding? Yeah. And he's asking, where you. are you? Where are you? Where? Are, yeah. yeah. Like, I think these are genuine questions that are, he's asking because he, for whatever reason at that particular moment, doesn't know. Yeah. And it's probably because he didn't even think that he should need to know that. I don't know. I, I've always viewed it like a switch. God can turn the omnipotence on and off whenever he wants because he's God. But I think sometimes he there it, wants to be surprised to I know, see what we do. I, we've, I know we've gotten away from the, what our topic was, but I'm sorry. But um, welcome to the Tinfoil Hat Club. We do this every week. <laughs> there was a, I think it was, I can't remember if, um, what translation it was, but it was the discussion between, um, about Isaac with uh, God, Sarah, and Abraham. And um, I can't remember which one it was. I think it was a Targum, one of the Targums, Genesis Targum. If you look into that, it's it, it's like huge, expounded. It goes into detail of everything. It's Aramaic, so it was done before. Is this like a deep? Like philosophical dive into Genesis? It's, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. And, was and, this Dead Sea Scrolls? So they found something? Yeah. I, I bu- don't quote me yeah, on yeah. it. But, um, but there was a conversation they had, and God felt that he knew their hearts, mm-hmm. and he could have like said something, but he felt since they were, it says since they were a married couple, he should not intervene. Um, between Abraham and Sarah. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And that just, I mean, that just, I'm not saying that. Well, again, I always use the story that Heiser uses about David and Kyla. Yeah. He goes and he kills the Philistines for Kyla, saves the city. He's there and he's in the walled city. And he finds out that Saul's going to come and kill him. And he goes and he basically prays and asks God, like, hey, is Saul going to come kill me? And he says, yeah, he's going to come kill you. It's like, really? The people of Kyle will hand me over even after I just saved them and lost a bunch of my dudes? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, they're going to do that, bro. <laughs> and he's like, okay, I'm out. Yeah. But you can see there that clearly, if you stay here, this is what's going to happen. If you leave, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because, and we all know, like every every entity in God's creation, even Christ, even Jesus had free will. Yeah. Right? I mean, why would the devil bother to tempt him right. if he didn't have free will? Yeah. And I think it's that free will that allows itself, like, it's like any good relationship, right? I mean, like, you just use the term relationship. It's no different with God because, like, you guys are married. I'm married. If we have a controlling relationship, if one person is controlling the other person, <laughs> good luck having a happy marriage there. <laughs> you have to trust. Yeah. You have to have free will in order to have true love. And God loves us more than we could ever understand, more than we, which is crazy because as a parent and as, you know, you fall in love with a person, you marry that person and you, and you love that person, your parents, all these people and your kids and everything. And and you think 
I can't imagine God loves me more than I could ever understand, even how I love all those people. And he does that because he has, we have free will. And I think that's what, you know, when your kids do right, we have this experience as parents where like we spend years and years climbing up this hill, right? And you just feel like you're just climbing and then you get knocked down and you climb some more and you get knocked down. And then without your intervention, you see your kid do something or say something. And it's like, yes, there it is. All my hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, a tear rolls down my cheek right now because they did, they did yeah. the thing, right? Without me having to prompt them. And I think that's the same way on a small scale how God feels about us when we challenge him and we want to know more about him. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, like, you know, for you guys, like a good example would be, you know, when you started dating, we got into it last week, some of the things you were into, right? Like there's going to be some challenge in there out of the love aspect, right? Of like, hey, you know, they see this as a concern. I want I love you. I'm. You're not going to get through that without having challenge. Yeah. Right. But that's how you grow. Yeah. And I think the same thing when we challenge God, you know, or go read his word, because it's not like, you know, you're, you're blaspheming God or you're, you're turning away from God or whatever. You're just challenging like the word and you want to like, no, like, what does this mean? And I think God can take it. Yes. You know, he can take when you get mad. He can take when you get sad. He can take when you want to challenge things. Clearly you brought the example up of, of, you know, Moses. Yeah. Could have struck him dead. I was thinking about it at one point. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be married anymore. I'm killing you. <laughs> uh, granted, that was for some uncircumcision <laughs> issues, but <laughs> that's a whole nother story. You can go find that one on your own. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I think it's important. Yeah. And I think it's okay to, to build a relationship, to challenge things and dive into things and want to know more. Don't be afraid to challenge God. Yeah. I, Don't test God. That's the difference. So um, I talk, I have a buddy at work I talk to quite a bit. And we were discussing heaven and hell this week. And just a, and he said, you know, I, I get people mad at the church <laughs> because I say, what if my heaven is different than yours? That's interesting. He said, what if in my heaven, there's somebody that went to your hell. Oh, oh, oh from a human standpoint. Yes. No, yeah. He said, nobody ever, no, he goes, nobody ever discusses that. No. So. It's very true. I've yeah. thought about that a lot. Yeah. You know, how can you have somebody that murdered, was a mass murderer that potentially could be in heaven? Yeah. Totally possible. Yeah. There is. Why not? Yeah. There probably is. Guarantee there is. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, I think it's not by happenstance either that you see some of the greatest heroes of the Bible do the most vile things. Yeah. Like David. We talked about David. I mean, oh, David yeah. murdered a dude so he could have his wife. Would the church show those people grace? Today? No. Yeah. No. No. Why, no is that? Why is that? Because the church has become a... Uh, completely, I was going to use a term that wouldn't be good, but <laughs> a completely run down, well, I'll just use the term run down, broken version of what it should be. Yeah. The fact that we are even discussing these, to me, okay, the fact that we have this much knowledge, that we've had it for this long, and that we're having this discussion and it'll be groundbreaking news for someone just like it was groundbreaking news for me. However, when I figured it out and I figured it out, like nobody taught me anything yeah. right, other than God, because how I found all this out after 40 years was I finally wanted to seek God out and build that relationship. Mm -hmm. And God was like, sweet. Yeah. I'm glad you're here. Sit down. We'll figure it out together. Yeah. And as I figured things out myself, I would go online and be like, am I cuckoo? <laughs> you know, and I would go do searches and I'd be like, I'm not cuckoo. Other people have to come to the same conclusion. Yeah. The other thing too is when you finally understand scripture and you can back up the scripture that you understand with more scripture that you understand, well, 
it's kind of hard to refute that. Where there are two or three witnesses. There you go. And even in scripture. It, it's hard to refute that. Like everything we've talked about today, and we didn't even get to all the verses that we had written down because there's a lot of them. Yeah. That back this up. And, and, and by all means, if this is new for you and you're like, you guys are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Please go look it up for yourself because you will find out that we are not cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, any of the three of us <laughs> sitting at this table, because we are not coming up with this on our own. This is scriptural. Yeah. It's not really up for debate, in my opinion. No. You know, because it's scripture. It's, yeah. Some of it was like, we don't know some of the things because we're just spitballing like what happens for those that are you know, murdered. But I mean, we don't know. Yeah. What about, okay. Aborted babies. Since I brought up the David thing, I've got to think that they're in heaven because they haven't gotten to the age where they can make a decision. How about this one? Do you think that they're the hundred and what is it? Uh, 44,000 that are, um, the guards in revelation. I, because it said they knew no woman. They were all virgins. I, I, where, I'm just throwing. No, no, no. I'm, I'm asking because I'm like, I don't, I know the 144,000, but I don't know the whole context of the story around it. It was like, was it talking about like it. I don't remember. I view revelation just like an amped up version of the Exodus. There are so many circular references that John makes in Revelation, it's ridiculous. And so, like, when they went out to the wilderness with the camp, there was 12,000 stationed around the camp to guard the camp. Mm -hmm. So you just, whatever. Times 12. Times 12, that you get 144,000. So those are around the city. Oh, uh, so this is third. Yes. What we refer to as third heaven earlier, yes. the, the new Jerusalem. Yes. So those people are going to be stationed around. Yes. And you're asking where those people come from. Yes. Oh, I have no idea. And I just. It's a fascinating, inter interesting dive. Yeah. Just like for me, like one of the things that I want to look at now, because the, one of the new things that I'm on now that we kind of alluded to and got into a little bit was the Satan aspect of things. Because it's kind of like a. It's kind of like a biblical wormhole. <laughs> when you read Enoch, it kind of opens up the rabbit hole for you because you start to dive in. And then as you dive in and you start wanting to look up other things that you found, you find other things that you want to look into and then yeah. you dive into those. And so what happens is, is just like a plant, you know, that you've planted this seed and you can see it start to just grow and grow and grow and grow because God waters it and he waters it through you because you want to gain more knowledge. Yeah. I mean, you have to be involved in that too, right? You got the canister in your hand, but he's providing the water. Ooh, that's very zen. <laughs> 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 I should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> that's one of our t-shirts. one of our t-shirts. <laughs> it's pretty good. So God gave me that one. That's all him. That's all him. <laughs> but it's very true, right? That's how that kind of works. So I think that's really important because that's how you learn God. That's how you get to know God. Yeah. And your faith will grow exponentially. And the other thing, too, is you'll learn that how deceived the world is. Yeah. How the world just has the wool pulled over its eyes and they're just being used, Yeah, you know, for, for things. And the church. Oh. I'm sorry, church. I'm not, not trying to bash the church. It's just, <laughs> oh, when I, I am, say I'm, church, I'm, I mean, like. I'm going to bash any church that doesn't uphold God's law. No, just in general. If you're not upholding God's law and you're not teaching things of the Bible, then I have a problem with you. And as we should as Christians. Yeah. Yeah, because you're leading people astray. Yeah. I have a problem with that. And we're called to have a problem with that. Yeah. You know, because the world needs truth right now and we're not giving it. You know, we play it safe. Yeah. Ooh, this is our heaviest one yet, Ben. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it's true. Yeah. We wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. Yeah. yeah I can't tell you how many times I... I can't think of a single atheist that I've ever talked to in my life that is an atheist because they have made the choice to be an atheist without any kind of negative influence from the church. Yeah. That's true. I wish that wasn't the case, yeah. but it's not the case. I can't think of a single one. Every single atheist that I've talked to has become an atheist because they had some kind of negative interaction with the church and that they have been pushed away. Yeah. So political infighting or, I mean, take your pick, just all kinds of bad stuff. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people. Oh, I went yeah, went to church, blah, blah, blah. There's one specific church, but I won't go there either. <laughs> not right now, anyway. <laughs> Off the air, but not not, not on the air. <laughs> but it, it's unfortunate because it's the truth. Yeah. You know, I, I can I can literally give you names right now. I'm not going to. So you're everyone's safe. Send me 20 bucks and I'll keep your names off the air. It's all good. You can buy your way out of future episodes. <laughs> oh, that another shirt. That's another shirt. <laughs> so anyway, complex topic, but I think really important. Yeah, for sure. We didn't so. even we didn't even scratch the surface really. But there was so no, much we stuff we wanted to cover. Yeah, we we did. I mean, we got we got to what's important. So maybe yeah. we can have a part 2 uh, later on, but yeah. The other thing we didn't really get into is we didn't really get into extra body or out of body experiences and stuff either. Oh, I got a story. Go ahead. <laughs> story time with Ben. <laughs> As you're featured uh, on every episode, story the, time with Ben. <laughs> For those of you listening, story time with Ben. <laughs> we were at a, a family function when I was a kid and um, it was on my mom's side and everybody's there at my aunt's house. And I start choking the minute I start choking, I'm watching everything up on the ceiling. I see everything going on. It's like, like you're seeing from the ceiling view down. Yeah, it's like I'm sitting on the cabinet. That's where I was at. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. Hmm. And I'm like, you know, like choking and everything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my cousin comes running in and gives me the Heimlich. And I'm still watching all of this while he's doing this. And I'm watching as I get throw whatever up, you know, all over my cousin's food. And I'm still, <laughs> I am still out until like a few minutes later, then I'm back in. That's weird. I watched you never died and died. No, I watched the whole thing. Weird. Yeah. Maria, have you ever had an out-of-body experience? No. I haven't either. I want to have one. Because <laughs> this body hurts sometimes, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, that's... that's. There's clearly something out there because how many people have died and, yeah. and then came back and like, yeah, saw some stuff. Yeah, it, it was weird. I watched the whole thing. What did we, what did, this was, we should, by the way, just as a fun side note, we should have kept recording last week because we had probably another hour, hour and a half conversation yeah. amongst the four of us. <laughs> yeah. That was all probably just as good as what we recorded. So we should have just kept it rolling afterwards about things. But we had talked about, I forget where I was going there, but we had talked about something that I was like, oh, that'd be great to talk about. Out of body experience or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember. It's, yeah, it's left me. But that's okay. But that sorry, my story was so late. But I, I believe it happens, and I I believe oh, I it. Think so I can tie it. Uh, oh, in the the Bible too, as well. Out of body experience. Yeah, where at? I I think it was, uh, it was more of I wouldn't say, but of traveling with the um with Philip and the uh, Ethiopian eunuch in Acts. Oh yeah, because. It said as soon as he baptized the Enoch, he was like picked up and moved mm. to another place. Mm -hmm. And I maybe in a some weird way, that's kind of like how um, the spirits travel. Yeah, it could be. You know, I mean, Christ is getting warped around too when he's yeah. being tempted by the devil. Yeah. I just remember what it was, what we were talking about off the air. It was another extra biblical text because you were talking about you read somewhere that after you died you get like taken oh, on Ebenezer seven day. Yeah, it was a uh, um, tour. Edras, I can't. Ezra, oh, Cedrus, the book of Cedrus, also in the Apocrypha, two, um, chapter seven, and it's a long chapter, and it's a like I think in ver it starts at verse seventy five and goes to a hundred. I believe that was in fact one of the books found in Qumran. There you go, and it, it 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 says like after you die, an angel will take you around 
and show you your like friends and family for the next seven days. It's interesting because one of the things in here too, I didn't get into it because we were focused on other stuff, but yeah. one of the things that they clearly state, Jesus clearly states when he's talking in that parable, he says the angels took, they dropped him off at and next to Abraham. Yeah. Like the angels took him there. So yeah. that, that must have been after the... Seven day tour. Seven day tour. <laughs> Is anyone else thinking of Gilligan's Island right now? Yes. <laughs> it's it's a seven day tour. It's it's interesting. I mean, there's there's got to be truth to it. That it makes a lot of sense. Why else wouldn't there be? Why why don't more people want to know this? Stuff? I I think they do. I think they do, and I think that's why we have an important space in what we're doing. Yeah, because we are going to talk about things. We're not. I'm not. I, I'm. It's too late in the game for us to be like, oh, we don't want to be controversial. <laughs> like, are you kidding me, man? I don't know. Look around you, but things are getting pretty bad. Yeah. And they're just going to get worse. Yeah. Right. So we need to save as many souls as possible. And if any of these conversations, you know, spurs anybody on to dive in their Bible and, and establish a relationship or deepen their relationship with God and Christ, mission accomplished. Yeah. That's where I'm coming from. Interestingly enough, the book of Maccabees, not a single scrap of that book was found in Qumran. Which makes a lot of sense because they were pro, yeah. pro Pharisee, and that's when the Pharisees came to power, mm -hmm. and they ran out all of the Levite priests. Yeah, so the community in Qumran was probably not too favorable with the Maccabees. Yeah, <laughs> pagans <laughs> with your pagan jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> Have your Pharisees, which is also you and I talked. I think it was an interesting statement. I forget where um, Christ says at one point. Uh, he's telling the disciples, I do believe, that you need to listen to the Pharisees because they are teaching God's law. However, they're being hypocrites when they're doing it. Yeah. But he also goes on to say the reason you need to listen to them is because they're teaching the law and they're sitting in Moses' seat. Yeah. Which is kind of a little doo -doo jab jab. At, yeah. They're sitting in Moses' seat, which technically was Aaron's seat, but Moses is obviously the leader, so that's probably why he referenced Moses. Moses. Yeah. And, you know, he's saying that, yeah, these posers are <laughs> have taken over. So anyway. Do you have something else? No. Oh. All right. <laughs> we're at 100. Uh, oh, 100. <laughs> well, we are at 122 minutes. No, no, we're not that far in. An hour and 41 minutes. Oh, we went long today. We did. That's okay. It's good. It's good. We could, we, I think we could keep going. We probably could and just chop it into two pieces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We will we'll call this one a we'll call this one a, a wrap. But it was good. It was good. Thanks for joining us, Maria. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Absolutely. It was awesome. So we just, uh, poor A, uh, it's not her, not her jam. No. That's okay, though. She's like, yeah, I don't know how much I have to throw in the mix on that one, but that's okay. She's good. She sits there and she has to listen to me, poor thing. So her brain probably already hurts because she's <laughs> got to listen to me so much go on about stuff. Be like, you won't believe this when I read. This is crazy. So she gets and That's to, how I am. It's like, I was listening to this today because I you know, can't really read. So I had listened to everything. So, yeah. like, so I'm like, we walk of an evening. So I normally tell her about on the walk or, you know, so it's like. And we kind of chew. I chew on it for a while, you know. I'm like, I wonder what that meant. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, I don't know. I was. She's thought. like my puke pad. <laughs> I just puke all over. It's so bad. <laughs> it's such a gross descriptor, but kind of like when I was choking, I puked all over my. Puked all over yourself. There's no out of body. So she probably wishes she had an out of body experience. Sometimes she's like, oh, I don't want to hear you anymore. And just uh, no. She never says that. She's awesome. So, all right, it was fun. Yeah, it's always fun, man. All right, y'all. We will catch you next time on The Foil. God bless and take care. Bye.
唱的。